Chapter One of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Four, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. Chapter One that in nothing is the son inferior to god the father because he is of him by nature although he be said by some to be subject thirty eight thirty nine because i have come down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of the father that sent me and this is the will of him which sent me that of all which he hath given me i should lose none of it but should raise it up at the last day this passage will seem hard to a person who considers it superficially and not far removed from offence regarding the faith so that they even expect us hence to fall into difficulties hard to be overcome which come from our opponents but there is nothing at all hard herein for all things are plain to them that understand as it is written and write to them that find knowledge, that is, to those who piously study to interpret and understand the mysteries contained in the divine scriptures. In these words, then, Christ gives us a kind of proof and manifest assurance that he that cometh to him shall not be cast out. For, for this cause, saith he, I came down from heaven, that is, i became man according to the good pleasure of god the father and refused not to be employed in all but undesired works until i should attain for them that believe on me eternal life and the resurrection from the dead having destroyed the power of death what then was this that christ both willed and willed not dishonour from the jews revilings insults contumelies scourgings spittings and yet more false witnesses and last of all the death of the body these things for our sakes christ willingly underwent but if he could without suffering them have accomplished his desire for us he would not have willed to suffer but since the jews were surely and inevitably going to adventure the things done against him he accepts the suffering he makes what he willed not his will for the value sake of his passion god the father agreeing with him and co-approving that he should readily undergo all things for the salvation of all herein specially do we see the boundless goodness of the divine nature in that it refuseth not to make that which is burned its choice for our sakes but that the suffering on the cross was unwilled by our saviour christ yet willed for our sakes and the good pleasure of god the father you will hence understand for when he was about to ascend thereunto he made his addresses to god saying that is in the form of prayer father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as i will but as thou for that in that he is god the word immortal and incorruptible and life itself by nature he could not shudder at death i think is most clear to all yet made in flesh he suffers the flesh to undergo things proper to it and permits it to shudder at death when now at its doors that he may be shown to be in truth man therefore he says if it be possible let this cup pass from me if it may be he says father that i without suffering death may gain life for them that have fallen thereinto if death may die without my dying in the flesh that is let this cup he says pass from me but since it will not take place he says otherwise not as i will but as thou thou seest how powerless human nature is found even in christ himself as far as it is concerned 
but it is brought back through the word united with it unto god befitting undauntedness and is retrained to noble purpose so as not to commit itself to what seems good to its own will but rather to follow the divine aim and readily to run to whatever the law of its creator calls us that we say these things truly you may learn from that too which is subjoined for the spirit indeed he saith is willing but the flesh is weak for christ was not ignorant that it is very far beneath god befitting dignity to seem to be overcome by death and to feel the dread of it therefore he subjoined to what he had said the strongest defence saying that the flesh was weak by reason of what befits it and belongs to it by nature but that the spirit was willing knowing that it suffered naught that could harm seest thou how death was unwilled by christ by reason of the flesh and the inglory of suffering yet willed until he should have brought unto its destined consummation for the whole world the good pleasure of the father that is the salvation and life of all for doth he not truly and indeed signify something of this kind when he says that this is the will of the father that of those who were brought to him he should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day for as we taught before god the father in his love to man brings to christ as to life and the saviour him that lacketh life and salvation but i perceive that i am saying what pleases not the enemy of the truth for he will by no means agree to the things which we have just said but will cry out loudly and will come with his shrill cry whither are you leading astray you sir our line of thought and are devising intricate inroads of ideas in drawing away the passage from the truth you blush i suppose says he to confess the involuntary subjection of the son for is it not hereby also evident to us that he will never command and bear rule in the management of affairs but is subject rather to the will of the father for he is conscious of so coming short of equality with him that he is constrained in some sort to make what he wills not his will and to do not altogether as seems good to him but rather what pleases the father and do not tell me says he dragging the expression into the incarnation it is as man that he is subject for lo as thou seest he being yet god and bare word and unentangled with flesh came down from heaven and before he was at all clothed with the form of a servant was subject to the father that is to say as his superior and ruler with dread words good sir as you surely deem and swift coursing exceedingly do you overrun us yet are they words that go not straight forward but are scared out of the king's beaten highway and having left as the greek proverb hath it the carriage way you are pressing forward upon precipices and rocks for vainly do ye maintain against us that the son obeys the father ever speaking as though any of them who deem a right thought that one ought to hold the contrary and were not rather determined to agree with you herein for we do not conceive of the holy and consubstantial trinity as ever divided against itself or cleft into diverse opinions or that the father may be or the son or the holy ghost are severed unto what seems good to each individually but they agree in all things since of one godhead it is clear one and the same will ever existeth in the whole holy trinity away then with a long argument with us hereon still be the spirit that would wrangle where it least of all should for since none is indignant thereat it is superfluous still to press it but since ye accustomed to think and to hold most perverse things term the son's agreement with the will of the father subjection of necessity 
on this matter we will discuss with you what is right for if this statement were put forth by you in simplicity we too would with reason hold our peace and not too strictly test the agreement of language but since we see that it is put forth in deep malice we shall of necessity oppose you trusting in the power of the holy ghost and not to our own words for not absolutely nor simply as his rule of conduct nor yet for every action did the son affirm that he did not wholly and entirely hold by his own will but he says that he kept his father's will in one definite act on account of thy resting with words as i conceive providing as god for our security but he endured what he would not and for our sakes made it his will i mean his suffering upon the cross since so it was well pleasing unto his father as we have said before and one may see the proof straightway laid down and the principle evidently set before us on which as himself says he left his own will and fulfils the father's for this he saith is the will of the father that of all which he hath given me i should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day and that the suffering on the cross was really unwilled alike and willed by the only begotten hath been clearly stated before but we shall state it again hereafter with more accurate proofs simplifying the truth to our readers but i will proceed first to the examination of the subjection alleged by you it being previously laid down and unhesitatingly confessed by you that the wills of the holy trinity ever coincide into one will and purpose let those subtle disputers tell us then whether in the name and fact of subjection the being of the son consist and this is his nature in the same way for instance as humanity belongs to a man or whether he existing before in his own proper mode is subject to the father as one might conceive of an angel for instance or any other reasonable power for these things being and existing are recipient of the mode of subjection if then ye say that the being of the son consists in his being subject to the father he will be a subjection rather and not a son how then tell me will ye not be manifest triflers for how can this subjection be conceived to exist of itself without having its being in any of the things that are for such things are usually the accidents of the necessarily pre-existing subjects wherein they are wont to be and not otherwise and are viewed as belonging to substances or befalling them rather than having any existence in themselves and as lust for instance which calls and impels us to anything has no existence in itself but is conceived rather in him who is recipient thereof so subjection pointing at some sway of the will to the duty of subjection to any will not be conceived of in its own nature but will rather be as passion or will or desire in some one of the things that are besides the name and fact of subjection spoken absolutely will not be conceived of as properly predicated of any one nor will one know whether it be good or bad unless it be added to whom the subjection is for a man is subject to god but also to the devil and as the name wise is a mean term for some are wise to do evil and again the wise shall inherit glory having clearly their wisdom in good things so too subjection is a kind of mean term and not a truth definitely expressed for it is quite uncertain to whom the subjection is hence also the nature of the son is left in uncertainty if it be conceived of as according to you a subjection for a subjection to what if no one were brought forward one could not say without falsehood 
but that the subjection will not exist of itself in its own mode of being we bringing forward some grosser and more obvious reasoning in regard to things already made shall see and do thou accept a demonstration besides for if we grant that the being of a man for example consist in his being subject we shall consider that his not existing consists in his not being subject how then was it said by the psalmist to some one as being indeed and existing but not yet subjected submit thee to the lord and entreat him seest thou then how utterly foolish it is to suppose that subjection has any existence in itself one must then of necessity confess that the son was and existed previously in his own nature and so say that he was subject to the father what then tell me is there to constrain that he who is of the essence of his father the exact impress of his nature should fall from his equality with him on account of his being obedient for we who think and speak rightly know that he is consubstantial with the father and give him equal honour in all respects and consider that in naught does he come short of god befitting divinity but do thou see in what manner thou canst thrust away from equal honour with the father on account of the alleged subjection him who enjoys equal goods by reason of identity of essence but this very thing says he will make for our side of the argument namely that the son is obedient to the father and doth not overmuch consider his own will but yields rather to that of the father as above him and greater than he but this very thing according to your own words sir which you think will aid your argument you will find to be nothing but the fruit of your own unlearning for if we were disputing which was superior in dignity and had the greater glory your ever-repeated argument would even then scarce seem to have any seasonable ground but since the mode of consubstantiality is being examined into how shall ye not be caught in no slight folly attributing to god the father superiority therein over his own offspring for the terms greater or less or the like we do not allow to be strictly essences as we said of subjection but they are something external and qualities of essences for that which already pre-existed and is will be recipient it may be of greater or less by comparison with another thing but if there is not before it or pre-existent in respect to which such things would happen how will they exist by themselves albeit conceived of and defined under the class of accidents hence in telling us of greater or less ye do not touch the essence of the only begotten nor yet that of the father but only with external excellences or shortcomings embellish as ye suppose the father and revile the son although ye hear him openly crying aloud he that honoureth not the son neither doth he honour the father and that all men ought to honour the son even as they honour the father for that things which can no way be severed into foreign alienity but have one and the same essence must be endowed with equal glory christ most excellently teaches and that he accepteth not to receive testimony to himself from men as himself said but came forward as himself unto himself a witness credible and more worthy than all that are and he being by nature truth will surely say true as one may prove from the very quality of things for you will probably grant that the greater or less belong not to the very essence of aught but to the things in respect of their essence for instance a man will not be greater or less than another man in respect of his being conceived of and called a man for neither is man less than man qua man neither is he greater than man qua man for the count of nature is seen to be equal in all 
and the same method of reasoning will hold of angels too or anything else that is made and enrolled among creation therefore such things are found to be utterly without place in regard to the essences themselves but are the accidents of the essences or of what belongs to the essences as we have delivered above how then will the father be greater than the son god by nature than god by nature for the son having been begotten of him will surely compel you even against your own will to grant him consubstantiality with him it having been premised then and unhesitatingly admitted that the son is by nature god let us consider if you please whether by paying him equal honour with him of whom he is we shall confer honour upon the begetter or shall do the reverse by insulting with less and inferior honour the begotten as is really and more truly the case for it is the glory of the father to have begotten one such as himself is by nature but the exact contrary will befall for it is not me to utter it if the son retain not the natural condition befitting him having inferiority either in glory or in aught else that should belong to him in order to be through all things manifested the all-perfect and very god if then he being thus by nature honour the father mock not thereat o man nor be found guilty of ignorantly finding fault where there is least occasion for it for it were meet i suppose to admire him for this too that he honours and loves his father for every species of virtue has as its source and root the essence that is above all in it first good things have their rise and flow down to us who are made after its image wherefore us too the lawgiver bade to honour as was due father and mother yea and annexed the most noble rewards thereto for he knew i suppose that it was a thing most great and so far removed from all reproach as to be even the giver of long enduring life as then we by being subject to and obeying our parents are not rendered other in nature than they but being as they are men of men and having in keeping the definition of manhood perfect we practise obedience as an excellent virtue so conceive in respect of the father and the son for he being what he is god of god perfect of perfect exact impress of the essence of his father think it not else than he too thinketh whose both counsel and word he is and will wholly will the same as the father compelled by the same laws so to say of consubstantiality to co-will all good things together with the father be no wise offended then o man when thou hearest him say i have come down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of him that sent me for what we said at the beginning this we will say again christ said this of a definite and plain matter for he saith these words teaching that he will to die for all because the divine nature had so counselled but willed it not by reason of the sufferings on the cross and as far as pertain to the flesh which deprecates death and we have already expended many words but it is convenient that we should see from the very nature of things that the suffering on the cross was unwilled by christ in that he was man we say then that it was a work of jewish folly that christ should be crucified at all and this was immediately to happen from them who were not unpractised in boldness hereunto by means of what they had already done both to the holy prophets and the saints who were at that time but since no otherwise was it possible to raise again unto life that which had fallen into death unless the only begotten word of god became man and it was wholly needful that made man he should suffer he made what he willed not 
his will the divine nature having permitted this from love to us for the artificer of all things wisdom that is to say the sun made that which was a machination of devilish perversity i mean his death in the flesh this he made a way of salvation to us and a door of life and the devil's hopes were overturned and he learned at last by experience that hard it is for him to fight against god the divine psalmist too seems to agree with what i have said of these things and to hint at something of this sort when he says as of christ and the devil in his net shall he humble him for the devil laid death as a net for christ but in his own net itself has he been humbled for in the death of christ was death undone and the tyrant who thought not to fall was brought to naught and it were not hard to add much more to these things but what is before us that will we say if the death of christ were not really and truly the work of jewish wills and the fruit of their unholy daring but the divine judgment were as some deem the sole leading spring thereto how needed it not that that which was determined upon should of necessity be accomplished and surely by the hands of men and not otherwise how then tell me would they who subserved the irrevocable decrees of god be yet justly punished and how would that miserable man through whom christ was betrayed have been in better case if he had not been born for if the passion be conceived of as willed by the saviour and not unwilled in any other sense what penalty would he reasonably pay who was set forth minister of his lord's will and of things which should surely come to pass will it not be evident to all that the things which seem good unto the divine and ineffable nature must surely come to pass and be done by some from these things and many more one may see that since the son of man hath come down from heaven to undergo death for all men willing alike was he and unwilling in order that he might raise up all at the last day since so it pleased the father himself for the good of all but he will not on these accounts that he be conceived of as by any means of a different nature or in aught inferior to him who begat him i suppose then that our opponent will at length blush and not gainsay our words on this point but if he again oppose and have settled that it is fit to wrangle yet more i say thus if the son hath come down from heaven not to fulfil his own will as himself says but the will of the father and our words on the just concluded consideration thereof haply please thee not must one not say that their wills are in opposition and that their counsel is divided contrarily but this is clear to all for if there were no hindrance the will in both would be perforce wholly one but if he put forward his will as it were diverse from the will of the father and fulfil that how is it not foolish to say that they are one and not other in respect of other let us see then wherein is the will of the father for so shall we discern the other also whereto it tends the will of the father then as the saviour himself hath said is that of all which he hath given him he should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day in that it is good and loving none will gainsay but transferring our considerations to the opposing will of the son we shall find it neither loving nor good at all but savouring of what is wholly contrary to the father and willing neither to save us nor yet to raise us up from death how then is he yet the good shepherd how gave he us a token of the loving-kindness that is in him in giving his life for us 
for if he hath come down from heaven to accomplish this of voluntary purpose how doth he fulfil not his own will in not destroying that which is brought to him but in raising it up at the last day but if this was not his will but he subserves rather the will of the father both in raising up and saving that is to say those who were lost and overmastered of death how shall we not be true in asserting that the son is neither good nor in any way loving to man let the christ opposer then have done his doubt being convicted on all sides of blasphemy and let him not bay at us concerning these things with his bitter words forty for this is the will of my father that every one which seeth the son and believeth on him have everlasting life and i will raise him up at the last day having now defined the good will of the father he makes it clear and sets it forth more at large for the consideration of the hearers through repeating it yet again for what the mode of bringing is and what any gain from being brought he clearly explains the father then giveth to the son who hath power to quicken them things lacking life he giveth thus through knowledge inserting in each one the true apprehension of the son and power to understand purely that he is god of very god the father that he thus minded and adorned with contemplations hereto belonging may be brought to the reward of faith that is a lasting and endless life in bliss the father then bringeth to the son by knowledge and god befitting contemplation those to whom he decreed the divine grace the son receiveth and quickeneth them and engrafting his own good into them who are of their own nature apt to decay and shedding upon them as a spark of fire the life-giving power of the spirit reformeth them whole wholly unto immortality but when thou hearest that the father brings them and that the son gives the power of living anew to them that run to him do not go off into absurd fancies as though each were supposed to do individually and severally what belongs by fitness of nature unto each but rather understand that the father is co-worker with the son and likewise the son with the father and that our salvation and recovery from death to life is the work so to say of the whole holy trinity and know that the father is sufficient unto all might and need and likewise the son and the holy ghost but through the whole holy trinity come the good things to usward and god the father is found all things in all entirely through the son in the spirit we must nevertheless observe this also the great is found to be the value of belief in the son for it hath life as its reward but if god the father is known in him who is son by nature who will endure any longer them who exclude him from the essence of the father and have a mouth unbarred to blasphemy against him for wherein he says he can raise again to life that which has fallen into death in these same words without any distinction intervening he mounts up to identity of nature with the father for quickening is a work proper to life and since the father is by nature life life surely will he to be conceived who is of him by nature that is to say the only begotten end of chapter one part one chapter one part two of commentary on the gospel of john book four by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 41. The Jews then began murmuring at him, because he said, 
I am the bread which came down from heaven. Again are they angry who of those things which are spoken by Christ understand no wit, and herein may be especially seen the uninstructed mind. For not being able to grasp the ideas whereby they might, it is like, be transmade unto the better, the end in unseasonable littleness of soul. For shall not we find what has been said true in respect of the Jews themselves? For why are they angry? What reason call them thereto? Why do they murmur? Albeit they ought rather to have applied a more diligent mind to what was said, and from the very deeds wrought to have considered the truth, and by the miraculousness of what had been accomplished, to have come to most tried knowledge, whether christ would lie in calling himself bread and bread which had come down from heaven or whether he was true and it was really so for in this way might they by judging aright be led easily unto the discovery of what was profitable for them but without any inquiry they are angry although in what had already passed christ had shown himself the true and very bread of life contrasting himself with the manna which was given typically and in shadow to their fathers in the wilderness for he that cometh to me he says shall never hunger whereas they who eat of that manna obtain some little and easily lost fleshly enjoyment but they who come to him by faith will not attain unto an enjoyment like theirs, but will rather have a harvest of the lasting grace of the blessing. The mind of the Jews therefore stumbles, looking only to earthly things, and this it was that was sung of them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back alway, that they, never turning them to the knowledge of the divine mysteries, may evil evilly perish on account of their own folly and their most unbridled unbelief and we calling to mind what is in the writings of moses shall find that murmuring against the most excellent and good was inherent in the jews as a sort of patrimony but bitter its end did experience show both of old in the case of those and now no less with these for those did murmur in the wilderness, and make unthankful outcry against God, but were destroyed of serpents, as the wise Paul too testified. And these murmur against Christ, and insult their lawgiver and redeemer by their so prolonged unbelief. But command shall be given to the serpent, and he shall bite them, as it is written and they shall be set as a banquet before the all-devouring beast for ever doth unbelief of necessity terminate in an all-grievous end forty two and said is not this jesus the son of joseph whose father and mother we know how is it then that he saith i have come down from heaven o deep unlearning and understanding darkened with unmixed strong drink the heart of this people is waxen fat as it is written for indeed they perceive not a whit of those things which they ought clearly to understand and both think and speak things worthy of laughter for they ought rather exercising themselves in the writing of the all-wise moses and delighting themselves in the preachings of the holy prophets to have considered that not without flesh or bodily array was christ expected to come to us but in human form was it foretold that he would appear and that he should be found in this common garb of all therefore does the prophet's voice tell us that the holy virgin shall conceive and bear a son and the lord is found to have sworn in truth unto blessed david which he promised he would no wise turn from that of the fruit of his body would he set upon his throne as it is written it was foretold too that there should come forth a rod out of the root of jesse but they rushing into so great unreason perceive it not 
supposing that since they knew the mother after the flesh of him who was foreannounced to come with flesh they ought therefore utterly to disbelieve that he had come down from heaven for even though we do not find that this took place in regard of the body yet the divine word dwelt in his body from the virgin as in his own temple having come from above from the father unto us and for the salvation of all lay hold on the seed of abraham that in all things he might be made like unto his brethren and might call the nature of man unto sonship with god being declared alike god and man but the jews not understanding the economy with flesh of our saviour christ from knowing his mother and father though he was not his father are not ashamed of being annoyed because christ said he came down from heaven in this too ariseth to us an example of no small profit for hence we learn in respect to ourselves that it will do us much harm if we do not rather with the spiritual eyes of the heart consider the virtue that dwells in the saints and look on the glory that is hidden in them but on account of the frequent meanness of bodily appearance hold of no value what is great before god and precious thus god says of the saints and the prophets speaking of all in the person of one blessed is the man that trusteth in the lord and the lord shall be his hope and he shall be as a tree vigorous by the water-side and shall throw forth his root in moist ground in the year of drought he shall not be afraid and shall not cease from yielding fruit deep is the heart above all things and there is a man and who shall know him i the lord who search the heart who try the reins when then we in our arrogance depreciate him that is known of god and admirable for the above-mentioned virtues looking only to the outward showing and perishable flesh and making meanness of body an excuse for littleness of soul towards him how shall we not be found to be contrary minded to the king of all and so incur no slight doom sometimes calling what is high low and putting light for darkness and sweet for bitter we must therefore keep to the saints the honour befitting them and must look at them rather through their inward hidden glory than what they are in the flesh yet most of us cannot bear to think that which is low in the world worthy at all of honour or of any glory even though he be renowned in virtue but looking only to the aggrandizement of riches and beholding the perishable and even now dying glory with no righteous eyes make no account of right judgment such with great reason does the disciple of the saviour laugh to scorn saying ye hypocrites if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment then ye tell he saith the rich man to sit in an honourable place and the poor stand thou there or sit under my footstool are ye not partial in yourselves albeit it is meet hence to observe to how reasonable a charge they become obnoxious who admire a man for external surroundings and not for internal goods for riches and the glory of riches bring in i suppose some foreign and fictitious glory to their possessors but the glory in the heart and the renown of good works will be a genuine and native riches to the holders not abiding with the flesh and decaying with it but dwelling with the soul while yet abiding in this life and removing with it on its departure whithersoever the ruler of all shall appoint for many the mansions with the father as we heard we must not then honour altogether or of necessity him that is renowned for wealth and gilt over with the petty glories of earth as in a picture but rather them to whom the splendour of their deeds 
begets unfading renown from god and their inward beauty flashes on them glorified with every form of good things forty three forty four jesus answered and said unto them murmur not among yourselves no man can come to me except the father which sent me draw him and i will raise him up at the last day the jews looked down upon jesus ignorant that his father is in heaven and in no wise acknowledging that he is by nature son of the lord of all but looking only to his earthly mother and joseph wherefore he replies more warmly to them and immediately to their prophet hastens back to his very god-befitting dignity and whereby he knows as god both their secret murmuring and that which has gone up into their mind through these very things he gives them to understand that they have fallen from the truth and formed an exceeding mean conception of him for how was it not rather their duty to crown with now god-befitting honour him who thoroughly knows the hearts and tries the motions that are in the mind and is ignorant of no device that is in their souls and to exalt him as far above the littleness of man as god is higher than the earth he unveiling therefore the thought buried in yet unuttered blame and making manifest the secretly whispered murmuring in them for the reason already specified says murmur not among yourselves then showing that the mystery concerning himself was a god-taught good in men and the knowledge of him a work of the grace from above he says that they cannot attain unto him save drawn by the teaching of the father but this is the plan of one whose only aim is to persuade them to consider that they ought weeping and sorrowing for those things wherein they had already grieved him to seek to be made free and to be drawn unto salvation through faith in him through the counsel of the father and the aid from above which lighteneth to them the way and maketh it smooth which when they sinned had become exceedingly rugged profitably did he confirm the promise that he would raise from the dead him that believeth and hereby again proves to the senseless ones that he is god by nature and very for that which has the power of quickening and of compelling to return to life him that is overmastered by death will rightly appertain to the nature of god only and be ascribed to no one of things originate for quickening is a property of the living and not of him who receives that grace from another forty five it is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of god perceiving as god the folly existing in his hearers he leaves not this his word without witness but shows already that he was of old forenounced and foreproclaimed by the holy prophets both taking away aforehand occasion from those who imagined that they ought to gainsay him and at the same time laying bare no less the unlearning that was in them and that they were unable to see this albeit instructed by the law unto the understanding of things to come he persuades them therefore to consent even against their wills for it was not likely that they would withstand the voices of the holy prophets that god the father would instil the mystery of himself in those who were worthy and would reveal his own son ineffably speaking to each and in god-befitting way implanting understanding thereof but having said above no man can come to me except the father which sent me draw him he shows that it is not a compulsory nor forcible drawing adding every man that hath heard of my father and hath learned cometh unto me for where there is hearing and learning and the benefit of instruction there is faith to wit by persuasion and not of necessity and the knowledge of christ is given by the father to them that are worthy 
helpful as of love, rather than constraining. For the word of doctrine requires that free will and free choice be preserved to the soul of man, in order that it may ask the just rewards of its good deeds. And if it have fallen from right, and from heedlessness have transgressed the will of the lawgiver, it may receive the doom of its transgression, and that most reasonable. But we must know that even though the Father be said to instruct any in the mystery of Christ, yet he will not work alone to this end, but will rather effect it through his wisdom, that is to say, the Son. For it is convenient to consider that not without wisdom will the revelation to their understanding be given to any from the Father. But the Son is the wisdom of the Father. By means of wisdom, therefore, will the Father effect the revelation of his own offspring in them that are worthy. And, in fact, to speak the whole truth and nothing else, one would not do wrong in saying that all the operations of God the Father toward any, or his will toward them, are those of the whole Holy Trinity. Similarly also are those of the Son himself, and those of the Holy Ghost. For this reason, as I suppose, when God the Father is said to reveal his own Son, and to call to him those who are more apt to believe, the Son himself is found doing this, and no less the Holy Ghost. For the Saviour says to the blessed Peter, who had most courageously made confession of faith in him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood revealed it not unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But in other instances he himself is seen doing this. And full well doth Paul boast as to himself, crying out concerning the mystery of Christ. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you will see that the Holy Ghost no less reveals Christ to us. And verily the most wise John writes, And ye, the anointing which ye received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. And the Saviour himself saith of the paraclete, that is, the Spirit, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak. And he will declare you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall tell it unto you. For being the Spirit of truth, he will enlighten them in whom he is and will lead them unto the apprehension of the truth. And this we say, not as severing into diversity, and making wholly separate, either the Father from the Son, or the Son from the Father, nor yet the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son, but since one Godhead truly is, and is thus preached is viewed in the holy and consubstantial Trinity, the acts belonging to each, and which seem to be attributed to them severally, are defined to be the will and operation of the whole Godhead. For the divine and unsevered nature will work through itself, in no divided way, so far as pertains to the one count of Godhead, although each hath personal existence. For the Father is what he is, and the Son likewise and the Holy Ghost. We must, besides, note this also, that things which point to aught by names are recognized in either, and one may see the one pointed out in the other. Therefore, needs is there that the Son be revealed through the Father, through the Son again the Father. For each is surely introduced with the other, and if any know that God is by nature Father, he will full surely conceive of the Son that is begotten of him, and just so the reverse. 
for he who confesses the son will not deny the father therefore in that god is father and is so conceived of and proclaimed he implants the knowledge of his own son in his hearers in that the son is said to be and is in truth of him by nature he proclaims the father therefore he says as to him i manifested thy name to the men for since the son was known by them that believed he says that the father's name has been made manifest but god the father will be conceived of as having implanted in us the knowledge of his own offspring not by a voice breaking forth from above and resounding round the earth like thunder but by the divine illumination shining forth as it were in us to the understanding of the divinely inspired scripture but unto this again you will find the son a co-worker in us for it is written of the holy disciples then opened he their eyes to the understanding that is the holy scriptures forty six not that any man hath seen the father save he which is of god he hath seen the father having foreseen as god that they would no wise receive the revelation through the spirit nor would take in the wisdom from above in its illuminations but would reject out of much ill-advisedness the very duty of seeing the father and so to say of being instructed by very vision of god which as they supposed was once the case with their fathers when the glory of god came down upon the mount sinai he first draws them back and turns them as with a bridle to the duty of not having a gross conception of god and of not supposing that the invisible nature will ever be visible for no one saith he hath seen the father at any time but probably he was hinting at the hierophant moses for the jews in this also thinking very foolishly supposed on account of his entering the thick darkness that he saw the ineffable nature of god and beheld with the bodily eyes that which is by nature the untainted beauty but lest by saying anything more openly respecting the all-wise moses he should seem to be urging them to their wonted state of mind he says indefinitely of all alike and as of him not that any man hath seen the father do not says he demand what is above nature nor be ye born in senseless course to that which is unattainable by all things that are made for the divine and incomprehensible nature hath retired and is withdrawn not from our eyes only but also from those of the whole creation for in the word no one he comprehendeth all things and in declaring that he alone is of god and hath seen the father he putteth himself outside of all whereof the no one may be understood declarative but since he is apart from all and while none hath seen the father he alone misseth not the seeing him how shall he not henceforth be conceived of not among all as one of them but external to all as above all and if whereas all things are said to be of god and none seeth the father for all things are of god as paul saith he alone seeth the father because he is of god deeming aright we shall understand the words of god to be of the essence of the father in respect of him alone for if it be not so why as we have said before since all things are said to be of god doth he alone attain unto the sight of him that begat him because he is of god wherefore it will be less accurately said of created things 
for all things are of god by creation in that they are brought into being by him but of the son in another and truer sense will his being of god be demonstrated as being of him by nature wherefore he not numbered among the all but being external to all and above all with the father will not share the infirmity of all in that he is accepted from affinity with them but mounting up unto the nature of him that begat him will surely see him from whom he is but how or in what manner either he beholds the father or is seen of the father it pertains not to our tongue to say we must nevertheless conceive of it in a god-befitting manner forty seven verily verily i say unto you he that believeth on me hath everlasting life faith therefore is the door and way unto life and return from corruption unto incorruption but herein no less is the economy a marvel to the learners for when he perceived that they understood nothing at all and saw that they did not suppose they ought to give any credence even to the words of the prophets he cuts off as far as possible their weakness unto faith by human arguments by an oath to its truth for setting before them which believe much to be envied prizes with their longing desire for these as with traces he all but constrains them against their will and persuades them to come to what is proclaimed to them for what would be more precious than eternal life to them to whom death and the sufferings from decay are bitter and this too will beseem a wise teacher to reinstruct unto the better by every way i say that invites unto life them who have chosen to think foolishly but he being eternal life promises to give himself to them that believe that is that christ may dwell in our hearts by faith end of chapter one Chapter Two, Part One of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Four, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, that the holy body of Christ is life-giving, wherein he speaks of his own body as of bread. Forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. I am the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and died this is the bread which came down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die full clearly may one herein behold that which was spoken afore by the prophet isaiah i was made manifest to them that seek me not i was found of them that asked not for me i said behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name all the day spread i out my hands unto a rebellious and gainsaying people for removing the whole case from his speech and having taken away so to say all that cloaked it he at length reveals himself unveiled to them of israel saying i am the bread of life that they may now learn that if they would be superior to corruption and would put off the death which from the transgression fell upon us they must needs approach to the participation of him who is mighty to quicken and destroy corruption and bringeth to naught death for this verily is a work proper and most fit for that which is by nature life but since they affirming that the manna was given to their fathers in the wilderness received not the bread which is of a truth came down from heaven that is the sun he maketh a necessary comparison between the type and the truth that so they might know that not that is the bread which is from heaven but he whom the trial shows to be so by nature 
for your fathers saith he and ancestors by eating the manna gave to the bodily nature its need gaining thereby life for a season and imparting to the flesh its daily sustenance therefrom with difficulty effected that it should not die at once but it will be he says the clearest proof of its not being the bread which is from heaven in a truer sense that they who partook were no way benefited thereby unto incorruption a token again in like way that the sun is properly and truly the bread of life that they who have once partaken and been in some way immingled with him through the communion with him have been shown superior to the very bonds of death for that the manna again is taken rather as an image or shadow of christ and was typifying the bread of life but was not itself the bread of life has been often said by us and the psalmist supporteth us crying out in the spirit he gave them bread of heaven man did eat angels bread for it seems to have been said to them of israel by the spirit clad but in truth it is not so but to us rather is the aim of the words directed for is it not foolish and utterly senseless to suppose that the holy angels which are in heaven albeit they have an incorporeal nature should partake grosser food and need such aid in order to prevail unto life as this body of earth desires but i think it nothing hard to conceive that since they are spirits they should need like food spiritual i mean and of wisdom how then is angel's bread said to have been given to the ancestors of the jews if the prophet speaks truly in so crying but it is manifest that since the typical manna was an image of christ which containeth and upholdeth all things in being nourishing the angels and quickening the things on earth the prophet was calling that which is signified by shadows by the name of the truth from the fact that the holy angels could not partake of the more earthly food drawing off his hearers even against their will from any gross conception as to the manna and bringing them up to the spiritual meaning that of christ who is the food of the holy angels themselves also they then who ate the manna he says are dead not having received any participation of life therefrom for it was not truly life-giving but rather taken as an aid against carnal hunger and in type of the true but they who receive in themselves the bread of life will have immortality as their prize wholly setting at naught corruption and its consequent evils and will mount up unto boundless and unending length of life in christ nor will it at all damage our words on this subject that they who have been made partakers of christ need to taste bodily death on account of what is due to nature for even though they falling into this end undergo the lot of humanity yet as paul saith they that shall live live to god fifty one i am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live for ever to say the same things unto you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe writes the divine paul to certain in this too i suppose instructed by these very words of the saviour for as those who are diseased with wounds need not the application of a single plaister but manifold tending and that not once applied but by its continuance of application expelling the pain so i ween for the soul most rugged and withered mind should many aids of teaching be contrived and come one after the other for one will avail to soften it not by one and the first leading but through its successive coming to it even if it come in the same words oftentimes then does the saviour bringing round the same manner of speech to the jews set it before them manifoldly 
sometimes darkly and clad in much obscurity at other times freed delivered and let loose from all double meaning that they still disbelieving might lack nothing yet unto their condemnation but being evil evilly might be destroyed themselves against their own soul thrusting the sword of perdition christ therefore no longer concealing anything says i am the living bread which came down from heaven that was he says a type and a shadow and an image hear him now openly and no more veiled i am the living bread if any man eat of this bread he shall live for ever they who ate of that died for it was not life-giving he that eateth of this bread that is me or my flesh shall live for ever we must then beware of and reject alike hardening ourselves to the words of piety since christ not once only but oftentimes persuadeth us for there is no doubt that they will full surely be open to the severest charges who turn aside to the uttermost folly and through boundless unbelief refuse not to rage against the author of the most excellent things therefore says he of the jews if i had not come and spoken unto them they had not had sin but now they have no cloak for their sin for they who have never by hearing received the word of salvation into their heart will haply find the judge milder while they plead that they heard not at all even though they shall specially give account for not having sought to learn but they who often instructed by the same admonitions and words to the seeking after what is profitable senselessly imagine that they ought to deprive themselves of the most excellent good things shall undergo most bitter punishment and shall meet with an offended judge not able to find an excuse for their folly which may shame him and the bread which i will give is my flesh for the life of the world i die he says for all that i may quicken all by myself and i made my flesh a ransom for the flesh of all for death shall die in my death and with me shall rise again he says the fallen nature of man for for this became i like to you men that is and of the seed of abraham that i might be made like in all things unto my brethren the blessed paul himself also well understanding what christ just now said to us says for as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil for no otherwise was it possible that he that hath the power of death should be destroyed and death itself also had not christ given himself for us a ransom one for all for he was in behalf of all wherefore he says in the psalms too offering himself as a spotless sacrifice to god the father sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body preparest thou me in whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou tookest no pleasure then said i lo i come in the chapter of the book it is written of me to do thy will o god was my choice for since the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sufficed not unto the purging away of sin nor yet would the slaughter of brute beast ever have destroyed the power of death christ himself came in in some way to undergo punishment for all for with his stripes we were healed as saith the prophet and his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree and he was crucified for all and on account of all that if one died for all all we might live in him for it was not possible that he should be holden by death 
neither could corruption overmaster that which is by nature life but that christ gave his own flesh for the life of the world we shall know by his words also for he saith holy father keep them and again for their sakes i sanctify myself he here says that he sanctifies himself not aiding himself unto sanctification for the purification of the soul or spirit as it is understood of us nor yet for the participation of the holy ghost for the spirit was in him by nature and he was and is holy always and will be so ever he here says i sanctify myself for i offer myself and present myself as a spotless sacrifice for an odour of a sweet smell for that which is brought to the divine altar was sanctified or called holy according to the law christ therefore gave his own body for the life of all and again through it he maketh life to dwell in us and how i will say as i am able for since the life-giving word of god indwelt in the flesh he transformed it into his own proper good that is life and by the unspeakable character of this union coming wholly together with it rendered it life-giving as himself is by nature wherefore the body of christ giveth life to all who partake of it for it expels death when it cometh to be in dying men and removeth corruption full in itself perfectly of the word which abolisheth corruption but a man will haply say fixing the eye of his understanding upon the resurrection of them that have slept they who received not the faith in christ and were not partakers of him will not live again at the time of the resurrection what shall not every created thing that has fallen into death return again to life to these things we say yes all flesh shall live again for prophecy foretells that the dead shall be raised for we consider that the mystery through the resurrection of christ extendeth over the whole nature of man and in him first we believe that our whole nature has been released from corruption for all shall rise after the likeness of him that was raised for our sakes and hath all in himself in that he is man and as in the first formed we fell down into death so in the first born again who was so for our sakes all shall rise again from the dead but they that did good unto the resurrection of life as it is written and they that wrought evil unto the resurrection of doom and i will grant that in no passing degree bitterer than death is the resurrection unto punishment and the receiving life again unto disgrace alone in the stricter sense then we must understand the life that is really so the life in christ in holiness and bliss and unfailing delight for that this is truly life the wise john too knows saying he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the son shall not see life but the wrath of god shall abide on him for lo lo he says that he which is in unbelief shall not see life although every creature looks to return again to life and to rise again it is then manifest that the saviour with reason called that the life which is prepared for the saints i mean that in glory and in holiness which that we ought to pursue after by coming to the participation of the life-giving flesh no right-minded person will doubt but since the saviour called himself bread in many of the passages that have already been before us let us see whether he would not hereby too bring to our mind any one of the things foreannounced and is reminding us of the things in holy writ 
wherein he was long ago signified under the form of bread it is written then in numbers and the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto the children of israel and thou shalt say unto them when ye come into the land whither i bring you then it shall be that when ye eat of the bread of the land ye shall offer up an heave offering a separation unto the lord a cake the first fruit of your dough shall ye offer for an heave offering as an heave offering of the threshing floor so shall ye heave it a first fruit of your dough and ye shall give unto the lord an heave offering unto your generations obscurely then and bearing a gross covering as of the letter did the law typify these things yet did it proclaim afore the true very bread that cometh down from heaven that is to say christ and giveth life unto the world for observe how he made man like us by reason of his likeness to us a certain first-fruits of our dough and heave offering as it is written was offered up to god the father set forth the first begotten of the dead and the first-fruits of the resurrection of all ascending into heaven itself for he was taken of us he took hold of the seed of abraham as paul saith he was offered up as of all and in behalf of all that he might quicken all and might be offered to god the father as it were the first handful of the floor but as he being in truth light put that grace upon his disciples for he says ye are the light of the world so too he being the living bread and that quickeneth all things and keepeth them in being by a likeness and through the shadow of the law was typifying in the twelve loaves the holy choir of the apostles for thus he says in leviticus and the lord spake unto moses saying command the children of israel that they bring unto thee oil olive pure beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually without the veil in the tabernacle of the testimony and then he proceeds and ye shall take fine flour and make twelve cakes thereof two tenth deals shall be in one cake and ye shall set them in two rows six in a row upon the pure table before the lord and shall put pure frankincense upon each row and salt and it shall be on the loaves for a memorial unto the lord the lamp then in the holy tabernacle and giving light without the veil we said in the foregoing was the blessed john nourished with the purest oil that is the illumination through the spirit outside the veil because his doctrine was catechetic for he says prepare ye the way of the lord make straight the paths of our god but the things within the veil that is the hidden mystery of christ he showeth not much for i he saith baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire seest thou then how he shines as in simpler speech calling unto repentance but the things within the veil he commits to him that baptizeth with fire and the spirit to lay open and these things we have set forth more at large on the words at the beginning of the book he was the burning and the shining light yet we touched on them now cursorily since it was necessary on john's passing away to show that the preaching of the holy apostles was near and straightway present for for this reason i suppose the scripture having first signified him by the lamp puts before us the consideration of the twelve loaves ye shall make it says twelve cakes two tenth deals shall be in one cake it is the custom of the divine scripture to receive ever the number ten as perfect and to acknowledge it as the fullest since the series and order of the consecutive numbers receiving a kind of revolution and multiplication of the same into the same 
advances and is extended to whatsoever one will he commands then that each cake be of two tenth deals that you may see perfection in the disciples in the even pair i mean both act of virtue and that of contemplation he bids two rows to be made and profitably so well nigh indicating the very position which it was as is like their custom to take ever receiving the lord in the midst of them and accustomed ever to surround him as their master and that we may know that as paul saith they are unto god the father a sweet savour of christ he bids frankincense to be put on the cakes and that they be sprinkled also with salt for it is said to them ye are the salt of the earth yea and with reason does he bid it be offered upon the sabbath day for they were made manifest in the last times of the world and the last day of the week is the sabbath and not only so but because at the time of our saviour's coming we held a sabbath spiritually for we rested from sin and then were the holy apostles also made manifest unto us by whose divine writings also we nourished attain unto the life in holiness therefore on the sabbath day specially doth he bid the cakes to be set out upon the holy table that is in the church for the whole is often signified by a part but what is holier than the holy table of christ therefore the saviour was pretypified as bread by the law the apostles again as cakes by their likeness to him for all things were in verity in christ but by likeness to him they belong to us too through his grace end of chapter two part one chapter two part two of commentary on the gospel of john book four by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain fifty two fifty three the jews therefore were striving among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat jesus therefore said unto them all things are plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge as it is written but darksome to the foolish is even that which is exceeding easy for the truly wise hearer shuts up the more obvious teaching in the treasury of his understanding not admitting any delay in respect of this but as to the things the meaning whereof is hard he goes about with his inquiries and does not cease asking about them and he seems to me profitably to press on to do much the same as they say that the fleetest dogs of the chase do who having from nature great quickness of scent keep running round the haunts of their game and does not the wise and prophetic oracle call to some similar habit seeking seek and dwell with me for the seeker must seek that is must bring a most unflinching zeal thereto and not go astray after empty speculations but in proportion as anything is more rugged in its difficulty with so much the more vigorous mind must he apply himself and carry by storm with more resolute onset of his thoughts that which is concealed but the unpractised and unteachable mind whatever starts up before it rages at it with its unbelief rejects the word conquering as spurious from undisciplined daring mounting up to the last degree of arrogance for that which will give way to none nor think that aught is greater than it how will it not at last be what we have just said and we shall find by looking into the nature of the thing that the jews too fell into this disorder for when they ought to have accepted unhesitatingly the words of the saviour having already through many things marvelled at his god-befitting power and his incontestable authority over all and to have inquired what was hard of attainment 
and to have besought instruction wherein they were perplexed they senseless repeat how to god as though they knew not that it is a word replete with all blasphemy for the power of accomplishing all things without toil belongs to god but they being natural men as the blessed paul saith received not the things of the spirit of god but the so dread mystery seems folly to them we then ought to derive benefit herefrom and re-establishing our own life by others falls to hold without question our faith in the teaching of the divine mysteries and not to apply how to aught that is told us for it is a jewish word and therefore deserving of extremest punishment and when the ruler of the synagogue of the jews nicodemus by name on hearing the divine words said how can these things be with justice was he ridiculed hearing art thou a master of israel and knowest not these things let us then found more skilful in the search after what is profitable even by others folly beware of saying how to what god works but rather study to attribute to him the knowledge of the mode of his own works for as no one will know what god is by nature but he is justified who believeth that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him so again will one be ignorant of the mode of his several acts but by committing the issue to faith and by confessing the almighty power of god who is over all will he receive the not contemptible reward of so good a decision for the lord of all himself willing us so to be affected saith by the prophet isaiah for my counsels are not as your counsels neither as your ways are my ways saith the lord but as the heaven is far from the earth so are my ways far from your ways and your thoughts from my mind but he that so greatly surpasses us in wisdom and might how shall he not also work wonderfully and overpass our understanding i would fain introduce yet an argument besides no mean one as i think for they who in this life take up the knowledge of mechanics as it is called often engage to perform some great thing and the way of doing it is hidden from the mind of hearers till they have seen it done but they looking at the skill that is in them even before the trial itself accept it on faith not venturing to gainsay how then may one say will not they with reason be open to heavy charges for daring to dishonour with their unbelief god the chiefest worker of all things who refuse not to say how to those things which he worketh albeit they acknowledge him to be the giver of all wisdom and are taught by the whole divine scripture that he can do all things but if thou persistest o jew saying how i too will imitate for thy sake thine ignorance and say to thee how earnest thou out of egypt how tell me was the rod of moses changed into a serpent how became the hand leprous and was again restored as it is written how passed the water into the nature of blood how passed thou through the red sea as through dry land how by means of a tree was the bitter water of mara changed into sweet how too was water supplied to thee from the breast of the rocks how was the manna brought down to thee how again stood the jordan in his place or how through a shout alone was the impregnable wall of jericho shattered and will that how never fail thee for thou wilt be detected already amazed at many mighty works to which if thou appliest the how thou wilt wholly disbelieve all divine scripture and wilt overthrow all the words of the holy prophets and above all the holy writings of thine own moses himself 
it were therefore meeter far that believing in christ and assenting unhesitatingly to his words ye should be zealous to learn the mode of the blessing and not be inconsiderately intoxicate saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat for the word this man too they say in disdain for some such meaning again does their arrogant speech hint at fifty three verily verily i say unto you except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye have not life in you long-suffering truly and of great mercy is christ as one may see from the words now before us for in no wise reproaching the littleness of soul of the unbelievers he again richly gives them the life-giving knowledge of the mystery and having overcome as god the arrogance of them that grieve him he tells them those things whereby they shall he says mount up to endless life and how he will give them his flesh to eat he tells them not as yet for he knew that they were in darkness and could never avail to understand the ineffable but how great good will result from the eating he shows to their profit that haply inciting them to a desire of living in greater preparation for unfading pleasures he may teach them faith for to them that have now believed there follows suitably the power too of learning for so saith the prophet isaiah if ye will not believe neither yet shall ye understand it was therefore right that faith having been first rooted in them there should next be brought in understanding of those things whereof they are ignorant and that the investigation should not precede faith for this cause i suppose did the lord with reason refrain from telling them how he would give them his flesh to eat and calls them to the duty of believing before seeking for to them that had at length believed he brake bread and gave to them saying take eat this is my body likewise handing round the cup to them all he saith drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the new testament which is being shed for many for the remission of sins seest thou how to those who were yet senseless and thrust from them faith without investigation he explaineth not the mode of the mystery but to those who had now believed he is found to declare it most clearly let them then who of their folly have not yet admitted the faith in christ here except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye have no life in you for wholly destitute of all share and taste of that life which is in sanctification and bliss do they abide who do not through the mystical blessing receive jesus for he is life by nature inasmuch as he was begotten of a living father no less quickening is his holy body also being in a manner gathered and ineffably united with the all-quickening word wherefore it is accounted his and is conceived of as one with him for since the incarnation it is inseparable except as regards the knowledge that the word which came from god the father and the temple from the virgin are not indeed the same in nature for the body is not consubstantial with the word from god yet are they one by that coming together and ineffable concurrence and since the flesh of the saviour hath become life-giving as being united to that which is by nature life the word from god when we taste it then we have life in ourselves we too united to it as it to the indwelling word for this cause also when he raised the dead the saviour is found to have operated not by word only or god befitting commands but he laid a stress on employing his holy flesh as a sort of co-operator unto this that he might show that it had the power to give life 
and was already made one with him for it was in truth his own body and not another's and verily when he was raising the little daughter of the chief of the synagogue saying maid arise he laid hold of her hand as it is written giving life as god by his all-powerful command and again giving life through the touch of his holy flesh he shows that there was one kindred operation through both yea and when he went into the city called nain and one was being carried out dead the only son of his mother again he touched the bier saying young man to thee i say arise and not only to his word gives he power to give life to the dead but that he might show that his own body was life-giving as i have said already he touches the dead thereby also infusing life into those already decayed and if by the touch alone of his holy flesh he giveth life to that which is decayed how shall we not profit yet more richly by the life-giving blessing when we also taste it for it will surely transform into its own good that is to say immortality those who partake of it and wonder not hereat nor ask thyself in jewish manner how but rather consider that water is cold by nature but when it is poured into a kettle and brought to the fire then it all but forgets its own nature and goes away unto the operation of that which has mastered it we too then in the same way even though we be corruptible through the nature of our flesh yet forsaking our own infirmity by the immingling of life are transelemented to its property that is life for it needed it needed that not only should the soul be recreated through the holy ghost into newness of life but also that this gross and earthly body should by the grosser and kindred participation be sanctified and called to incorruption but let not the jew sluggish of understanding ever suppose that a mode of some new mysteries has been discovered by us for he will see it in the older books i mean those of moses already foreshadowed out and bearing the force of the truth for that it was accomplished in outward forms too for what tell me shamed the destroyer what provided that their forefathers also should not perish along with the egyptians when death the conqueror of all was arming himself against the first-born is it not manifest to all that when they in obedience to the divine law sacrificed the lamb and having tasted of its flesh anointed the doorpost with the blood death was compelled to pass them by as sanctified for the destroyer that is the death of the body was arrayed against the whole nature of man by reason of the transgression of the first formed man for then first did we hear dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return but since christ was about to overthrow the so dire tyrant by existing in us as life through his holy flesh the mystery was fortified to them of old and they tasted of the flesh of the lamb and were sanctified and preserved by its blood he that was appointed to destroy passing by by the appointment of god those who were partakers of the lamb why then art thou angry o jew at being now called from the types to the truth when christ says except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye have not life in you albeit thou oughtest to come with more confidence to the comprehending of the mystery pre-instructed by the books of moses and by most ancient figures led most undoubtingly to the duty of faith fifty four 
whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and i will raise him up at the last day herein too ought we specially to admire the holy evangelist openly crying and the word was made flesh for he shrank not from saying not that he was made in flesh but that he was made flesh that he might show the union and we do not say either that god the word of the father was transformed into the nature of the flesh or that the flesh passed into the word for each remaineth that which it is by nature and one christ of both but in a manner unspeakable and passing human understanding the word united to his own flesh and having as it were transformed it all into himself according to the operation which lieth in his power of quickening things lacking life drave forth of our nature the corruption and dislodged too death which of old prevailed by means of sin he therefore that eateth the holy flesh of christ hath eternal life for the flesh hath in itself the word which is by nature life wherefore he saith i will raise him up at the last day instead of saying my body shall raise him up that is to say him that eateth it he hath put i not as though he were other than his own flesh and not wholly so by nature for after the union he cannot at all be severed into a pair of sons i therefore he saith who am become in him through mine own flesh that is will raise up him who eateth thereof in the last day for it were indeed even impossible that he which is by nature life should not surely overcome decay and master death wherefore even though death which by the transgression sprang on us compelled the human body to the debt of decay yet since christ is in us through his own flesh we shall surely rise for it were incredible yea rather impossible that life should not make alive those in whom it is for as if one took a spark and buried it amid much stubble in order that the seed of fire preserved might lay hold on it so in us too our lord jesus christ hideth life through his own flesh and inserts it as a seed of immortality abolishing the whole corruption that is in us fifty five for my flesh is true meat and my blood true drink again does he contrast the mystic blessing with the supply of manna and the savour of the cup with the founts from rocky beds and what he said afore in other words this he again says here manifoldly fashioning the same discourse for he does not advise them to marvel overmuch at the manna but rather to receive him as bread from heaven and the giver of eternal life for your fathers he says ate the manna in the wilderness and died this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die for the food of manna says he having for a very little time sported with the need of the body and driven away the hurt of want was again powerless and did not engraft eternal life in them that had eaten thereof that then was not the true food and bread from heaven that is but the holy body of christ which nourishes to immortality and life everlasting is verily the true food yea and they drank water also from the rock and what then he says or what the profit to them who drank for they have died that too then was not true drink but true drink in truth is found to be the precious blood of christ which uproots from the foundation all corruption and dislodges death which dwelt in the flesh of man 
for it is not the blood of any chance man but of the very life that is by nature wherefore we are entitled both the body and the members of christ as receiving through the blessing the son himself in ourselves fifty six he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and i in him manifoldly does christ initiate us by these words and since his discourse is hard of attainment by the more unlearned asking for itself rather the understanding of faith than investigation he revolving again and again over the same ground makes it easy in diverse ways and from all parts illumines what is useful therein fixing as a kind of foundation and groundwork the most excellent desire for it for he that eateth my flesh saith he and drinketh my blood abideth in me and i in him for as if one should join wax with other wax he will surely see i suppose the one in the other in like manner i deem he who receiveth the flesh of our saviour christ and drinketh his precious blood as he saith is found one with him commingled as it were and immingled with him through the participation so that he is found in christ christ again in him thus was christ teaching us in the gospel too according to matthew saying the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened who then the woman is what the three measures of meal or what the measure at all shall be spoken of in its proper place for the present we will speak only of the leaven as then paul saith that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump so the least portion of the blessing blendeth our whole body with itself and filleth it with its own mighty working and so christ cometh to be in us and we again in him for one may truly say that the leaven is in the whole lump and the lump by like reasoning is in the whole leaven you have in brief the sense of the words and if we long for eternal life if we pray to have the giver of immortality in ourselves let us not like some of the more heedless refuse to be blessed nor let the devil deep in wickedness lay for us a trap and snare a perilous reverence yea says he for it is written he that eateth of the bread and drinketh of the cup unworthily eateth and drinketh doom unto himself and i having examined myself see that i am not worthy when then wilt thou be worthy will he who thus speaks hear from us when wilt thou present thyself to christ for if thou wert always going to be scared away by thy stumblings thou wilt never cease from stumbling for who can understand his errors as saith the holy psalmist and wilt be found holy without participation of that holy preserving sanctification decide then to lead a holier life in harmony with the law and so receive the blessing believing that it hath power to expel not death only but the diseases in us for christ thus coming to be in us lulleth the law which rageth in the members of the flesh and kindleth piety to godward and deadeneth our passions not imputing to us the transgressions in which we are but rather healing us as sick for he bindeth up that which was crushed he raiseth what had fallen as a good shepherd and one that hath laid down his life for his sheep. End of chapter 2